We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image. Let's rock. If you're new to the tribe, Rad is across the table. Rich is behind the mix. My name is Yanni Bormeister and we are Unity Gym. Experts are turning driven people into athletes. This episode is brought to you by the Unify Movement System, the online program that balances strength, flexibility and fitness in an efficient 60-minute workout so you can unleash your inner athlete. Get daily coaching by us plus our epic gym and home UMS programs, extensive exercise library, private coaching group, and weekly coaching calls. As a valued listener, use the link in the description and get your first month free. Before we get started, as always, I'd like to give a big warm welcome if you're watching on the Unity Gym YouTube channel. Remember to smash that like button. The more likes we get, the more legends like yourself get to see this content. And always subscribe if you like what you see. We'd love to have you in the tribe. I'm excited to announce that joining us today, we have Phil White from ADPT Physio. Phil started work in the fitness industry in 2012, first as a remedial massage therapist and then went on to study exercise and sports science and a doctor of physiotherapy, postgraduate degree. Now he runs ADPT Physio, where they specialize in delivering the athlete rehab experience to everyone. Phil has been a massage therapist to the GWS Giants AFL team, Olympians, Paralympians, and a number of professional athletes. Always good to have you on the Phil uh, on the Phil oh, the show podcast. on the show Phil. Uh, on our podcast, nice to meet you. Yeah, um, yeah stoked to be here. And I, I'm really interested in this topic. It's one that, uh, yeah, I think there's some really good physio perspectives on it. That we I can hopefully um, add as well. So, mm-hmm. uh, just a personal point of interest with skill development for me. Yeah, it's a good one. Here we go. This Good question morning. comes from Vinny Brown from the UMS Movement Mastermind Group. Vinny asked, what's the best way to maintain or improve reflex response times for martial arts? And what exercises are best used to develop it? Uh, so Yanni wanted me to answer this one because of my experience with martial arts. I was a martial artist. I would have called myself a martial artist for a good, I'd say, 13 years. When I was 17, I started, um, well, look, when I was a when I was a kid, I started judo um, when I was probably seven years old or something like that. We did that for long enough that I remember a whole bunch of it. I have no idea how long I, I did it I for. Was five, you were seven. Yeah, but it was it was long enough that I remember a whole lot of the moves and the throws that we did. We we did a you know enough training in it that it that it carried through with me. And uh, then as a child, we did a taekwondo for a period of time and couple of other a couple, so a couple of different karates and i really don't know how long we did that for but it was long enough that when i started doing kickboxing at 17 years old i definitely had some experience and we got right into kickboxing from 17 did that for up uh, for me i did that for about a year or a year and a half and then i moved into kung fu and i never looked back and i we also watched every bruce lee and jackie chan and jet lee film on the planet Probably a dozen times. Many more than a dozen times for me. It got to a point. Yanni, Yanni showed a lot of enthusiasm probably for the first dozen time we we watched them. And then after that, he just got sick of it and got sick and tired of me uh, putting them on. But I was just fascinated by martial arts when I was um, a child and a teenager. And there was no YouTube back then. So that was, um, you know, we used to go to the um, to Blockbuster and get uh, the, the martial arts and movies. I remember we used to rate the video store based on their martial arts section. Yeah, yeah, we did. Like we how, did. Many how many martial arts movies they had. They had. You know, yeah. Yeah. It, was, it was a real obsession <laughs> for Yanni and me. And it was our introduction to um, the world of movement and, and our start to get us where we are. So then I started uh, Wing Chun and I did Wing Chun. I was right into that for um, a few years. Uh, and when I say right into it, I mean, I lived and breathed it like um, six days a week training. I remember there was a good five year period of my life where I used to wear my Kung Fu uniform just as my clothes because I did so much training that I just couldn't be bothered taking it off or I'd, I'd that's get it. A, that's a literal, literal. And it wasn't just his Kung Fu uniform because everyday life it was Kung Fu uniform. But then you went through a period where you actually invested in some classy kung fu outfits <laughs> so, when we went, yep. so we, when we would go out to a nightclub or a nice dinner at a restaurant he would be in a satin <laughs> or a silk freaking chinese yeah. monk outfit you know yeah. that was like gold or, or orange or yeah. black or white yeah, it was, you know it was a fun period of my life and then i uh, but then i got into i got introduced to wushu 
um, which is the martial art. It's really, it just means, wushu actually means martial arts in Chinese, uh, but it's the more acrobatic type of martial arts with all the animal styles and the long fist and southern fist and, and also Xing Yi, which was an internal style. And that's where I invested most of my time. And I did about 10 years uh, with the same teacher. I, I found an amazing uh, teacher when I was about 20. So yeah, I was a martial artist for a long time and it was, uh, it was my life. It was what I did every day after work. Uh, it was what I did on Saturdays, um, every Saturday for, for a few hours before I went off and enjoyed my weekend. And um, it's a, it's a, so it's a question that Yanni wanted me to, um, to answer that, I, that we felt that I could add some value to. And there's a, the, um, it's, a, it's a fun question. It's going to be a fun one for me to answer. So what's the best way to improve reflex times um, for martial arts and what exercises are best to develop it? When I think about it off the top of my head, there's really a couple of elements to this. One of them is for, for reflex, you absolutely need to be doing things that um, promote reflex. You need to be reacting to things. So in martial arts, it's um, you can't be doing things that are predictable if you want to increase reflex time. Now, there's some really good tools that we take from boxing drills where they are predictable, where you have like a, a ball swinging back and forward and you can see these great videos of Mark Tyson uh, moving around these things and they have their place, but you also have to go into a level of unpredictability, which is where you work with some, and the only real way to do that is when you work with somebody else uh, and you get them to, you know, throw punches so, or kicks so at you. Also what a floor to ceiling speed ball is used Yeah, for. yeah, that's right. That's Agility a, ball. Yeah, that's exactly right. So those drills in, in boxing are really, really good. And we used to use those in my Kung Fu Academy. We had a speed ball and we had a floor to ceiling ball and we used to use those. But also um, just by having somebody, like it, I think a lot of people get the wrong idea that when you do reflex work, it has to be fast and full paced. It doesn't. We A lot of really good reflex work that we used to do was just somebody throwing punches out at an irregular interval and you used to just have to move and as always it's the quality that will produce the results and like just as an example Vinny when we used to do like just ducking and weaving moving from left to right um, what I uh, found was really invaluable was when you would duck and weave in a way where you're moving away from the punch all the time you have to be intentional with that some ducking and weaving is the idea to get out of the way of the punch and other ducking and weaving is the idea of positioning yourself optimally to deliver a punch and if you're always just ducking and weaving in a way where you're always just getting out of the way of a punch, that translates to the way that you spar and you become somebody that always spars on the back foot. And there's a place for that, but you also have to have a place for being able to dodge and, and, and react in a way that, that optimally places you to deliver a strike. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are different things as well. And the way that I was always taught, and um, it produced a really good result because when I've sparred with people from other schools, I've fared pretty well. Um, and that is that my teacher used to teach us that when you're sparring and when you're training, there should always be somebody on the front foot and always somebody on the back foot. And you've got to recognize when those times are. When there's two people just going on the front foot always, it turns into a real slugfest. And if there's two people that are on the back foot, there's nothing ever happening at all. And that's something that you have to learn to read in the session. And that doesn't mean that when you're on the back foot that you're not positioning yourself ready to hit somebody. But if you look at the good fighters, they'll recognize when they're on the back foot and they'll... Um, you know, they'll position themselves in a way where they're not getting hit and they're letting the person punch themselves out and they're getting ready to deliver their hit. And Floyd Mayweather is just phenomenal at that. Yeah, some um, people are really exceptional at fighting um, on the front foot. Some are better at- Tyson was uh, exceptional at fighting on yeah. the front foot. And that's not to say he wasn't good at fighting on the back foot. But if you look at him, he just had this style where even when he was ducking and weaving, and you can see it in his training, he does all these drills where his coach is throwing punches at him as they move backward and he's just moving moving in, getting yeah. ready for that hit, you know? Yeah. And, and then, yes, yeah, so, so, so there's sort of like the counter striker or the attacker, you know, yeah. and, and, and then some are bru bru brilliant at both. Yeah. And so to summarize all of that, my take on that is that it's, um, what I learned was that reflex training can be done in a really bad way where if your partner or the way that you're training is coming too quick for you to be able to react in a, in a way that, like your teacher will say, the goal of this is to like, one of my favorite drills that we used to do in Kung Fu was we would stand with just our hands by our side. So we weren't relying on our arms. We were relying only on the head movement. And, and 
somebody would stand in front of you at a distance where they could hit you and they'd either do a right, uh, um, a jab or a cross. And if it was the cross, you would have to, you know, dodge in a way where your left shoulder would come forward and you were positioned where you could either deliver a punch as you ducked or you could be ready to deliver a, you know, a rip or a, or a hook. And then obviously vice versa for the other hit. But if, if they punch too fast for you when you were learning how to do it, your mind wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to react as quickly and you, and you just wouldn't put yourself in the right position. So I think the first thing to do is you've got to start in a way where it's a bit slower and then you speed up. But eventually you've got to get to that point. If you want to be able to deliver this in a sparring session or in a fight, you've got to get to a point where when somebody's throwing full speed punches at you, you can move in that way um, that will get you there. And then the other part to this, before I stop talking for a moment, because I could talk for a long time about this, obviously, is that the training that you do, if you want to maintain or even build reflex time, is you have to periodize in times where you're doing full speed uh, explosive movement. Do it, there, there, there is a time to do slow movement, you know, slow punches, slow kicks, but and and slow uh, training, you know, to to produce muscle or whatever. But if you're not doing strength training that is explosive, if you're not throwing punches and kicks that are explosive, then you'll never develop that explosive. Yeah, I'm gonna power. I'm gonna jump in and share my experience because this is something that, uh, and I'll do my very best not to offend all the martial artists. But um, there's in my in my in my experience and opinion, there's two types of reflex training. There's one where you do drills specific to the way the brain is encouraging movement, and in my, my the majority of my fighting experience was in boxing. I did about four years of kickboxing and then got very heavily into boxing. And we used to do a drill where my coach would drop a, co a 10 cent coin and we had to, in it from a fighting stance, punch and catch the coin. And he had a coin in both hands, so you never knew which hand was going to go. That was a very specific reflex drill. Then we would uh, um, uh, work on reflexes with our floor to ceiling ball. And the, the most floor to ceiling balls that I've ever seen in gyms are completely useless because the, uh, the bands on both the top and bottom are way too tight. So it becomes predictable. Mm. Whereas when you go to a proper boxing academy, the bands will be loose. So the ball bounces both, not just forward, backward, side to side, but it goes up and down as well. And that's really, really important because you need a little bit of looseness so that you can't predict what the the, the floor to ceiling ball is going to do then you've got a uh, speed ball and you always see people just uh, speed balling in a very fluent manner but when you properly train on a speed ball you're meant to properly train on a speed ball in all different um, uh, ways movements angles hooking uppercutting uh, there's all sorts of different things you can do there and then the last drill that we used to do that I found very good, which is where it starts to bring footwork into play, is touch sparring. Mm -hmm. And touch sparring is where you don't even wear gloves and you usually do it on the shoulders, uh, but you can also go to the, to the stomach and the hips. We used to do shoulders, hips, and stomach, which is that you have to touch the person on the shoulder um, or the hip or the stomach and do it without touch and without being touched, you know? And so now you're moving around a boxing ring in and out, um, bridging the gap, uh, keeping at distance and, and really bringing all of those sort of philosophies together. And then the final thing, and this is my biggest problem with most martial arts is that there's not enough training where you get to experience uh, someone else attacking you at 100%. Yeah. And that is sparring. And we used to spar three times a week at full force in boxing. And I did that for 16 years. And that is the big, I think, problem with most martial arts and that's the the reason why i've seen so many martial artists who have trained for eight or ten years get their ass kicked in a real fight is because they don't get to experience someone or like really trying to knock your head off or or, or, or take your legs off and and there's negatives and positives to that you know you've got to do enough training where you have to stop moving that around Sorry. um the there is there is training where you are doing it with minimal impact because every hit counts and every hit uh, compounds and and can cause damage to your brain and things like that. Um, and so I'm not recommending that everyone go out there and just start getting into fights. But at some point, you have to be able to apply all these drills that you're doing into a real situation. And when you're doing martial arts, often it's not till you go for a grading or a tournament that you really get to experience that. And I think that that can be really um, uh, impractical. 
I'll say. So can I take this down the physiological kind of direction now that we've had some really good like practical training experience? Yep. So when you think about the two different types of movements that humans can do, there's going to be reflex action and pre-programmed or like an unconscious action. So when you think about reflexes here, it's actually kind of an un like unfortunate that the word that we use for fast reactions is reflex because what reflex actually is, is a something that you have zero control over. So something when you, um, you might've seen like those tendon hammers where you'll like tap the tendon on the knee and the knee will kick out. Um, that's a reflex action and, and touching a stove and, and lifting your hand is also another reflex action, which is actually, um, it's basically your motor neurons are, are like are reacting without having any processing happening from your brain. So basically you get a signal from your sensory nerves, it gets your spinal cord and then there's a basically reflex loop that means like, hey, we don't need the brain brain to have to deal with this. We want to just quickly take ourselves away from that damage or um, with the tendon thing, that's just like a, a quirk of how um, like these these neural loops kind of work. So it's basically your, your body has an ability to do a movement that is so fast that if your brain had to process it, like it would just be too slow and you'd, you'd have burnt your hand and caused more, um, more damage. So there's, that's the reflex action. And then there's going to be conscious action. So that's where you're actually having a, like a neural drive from your brain, which is trying to produce a specific movement. Um, and so when it comes to like being able to get faster and more skillful and more precise with those, um, uh, those programmed from the brain, you need to progressively overload them. And so there's this idea of um, cognitive load. So basically cognitive load is like how many different tasks your brain is having to consciously think about and make um, purposeful action on. And so that's why when you watch someone who's like, you know, if you looked at a professional fighter going up against someone who's drunk in a bar, or maybe not the best example, but someone who's really aggressive and doesn't know what they're doing, like the professional fighter will look like they're in slow motion because they're just so relaxed. They're able to just like move out of the way, whereas the panicked <laughs> sort of yep. person like has to, you know, really like basically over overthink everything. And so when with with this this idea of cognitive load, you can start to, as you develop skill, automate processes. It's like, you know, when you're learning to drive, everything's really stressful. You're looking, you're, you're trying to take in so much information at once. You have to consciously decide whether that person's gonna pull out in front of you. You gotta consciously like freak out about whether there's a tra tra traffic light ahead. All of these things you're consciously thinking about, but then as you learn to drive, you'll get those moments where you dr you've been driving half an hour and you're like, whoa. Well, have I yeah, been yeah. in control of this car because you've automated these processes you've automated you've basically I've talked about like with neural drive for strength before about that idea of having a creek that um, turns into a river when you've like mm. accessed more motor units it's a similar thing with skill where if you've got done th one thing over and over and over again you become really good at doing that thing <laughs> like without having to put as much um, thought into it and so that idea of cognitive load is that if you can basically automate all these processes you can then target W the remaining like conscious thought into um, specific actions. And so um, that's where you see those people who are really skilled versus someone who's totally amateur is like the, the skilled person will have automated most of the skills so then they can make really informed decisions about um, what they're doing. So that's kind of like a, a basics of skill. And the thing with skill is like frequency is the real um, key one where you want to be doing something frequently. It's not, you can't just <laughs> train once and and hope the best like you've got to t train your brain over time like over um over frequency and the other thing with training is yeah you want to make it progressive so you can't just jump into a like an intense sparring match and expect to figure this stuff out yep. you've got to do exactly what rad was talking about with you know you're starting out simple you're starting out slow because that's teaching you're, you're getting that skill development and you're making all these sort of automatic decisions which instead of being totally reactive you're you're able to program and, and teach that automatic reaction this so you, is yeah. this this is one of the um one of the big reasons why i I stayed with my Sifu that I stayed with for a decade because I worked with a lot of teachers before for anywhere from between three months and two years where it took me either quite a short amount of time or a little bit of a longer time to realize that I didn't feel that this person could teach me what I wanted to learn. And the teacher that I stuck with for a while, he was very progressive like that. And we didn't actually start full on sparring like Yanni talked about until a couple of years into my training. And what he taught us was that there isn't a point in doing really intense sparring until you have 
um, automated these basic uh, responses. Because what happens is once you get to that point where somebody's really throwing hunches at you, if the if the basic stuff isn't automated, you just get annihilated and everything that you practice just goes to shit. And you can see that in novice martial artists all the time where when they actually get in the ring and they do some sparring, like when you look at them training on their own, they look like they're quite good. But then when they get in the ring, they really don't have it there. And there's this balance where you have to get uh, all of this stuff together. And unfortunately, my personal experience with martial arts is I think there is so much more of a time investment required to get anything that is that would actually translate to being able to really use in a fight or in a competition than what most people are willing to give. And my experience was that um, it took me years of training, of doing training five or six days a week, anywhere from two to four hours a day, before I got to a point where I could actually really use what I had worked on in a, uh, and I never went and did any uh, competitions or anything like that, but we used to, like Yanni said, we used to do full on sparring um, and it was hell for leather. And it took me years before I could get there. And it's actually one of the reasons why I stopped doing martial arts when I got into my mid thirties. Um, when you guys remember when I used to, yeah, when we yeah. opened Unity Gym, how much I used to do it because I said, look, I'm going to really, because I went into the army, that's what stopped me doing martial arts when I was 30. I went to the army and it was just way too hard to maintain when I was in there. And then when I got out of the army, I said, all right, I'm going to get back into this. And I was training, if you guys remember, for maybe two to three hours a day doing it. And I did that for about a year before I really just started to question. I thought, man, I don't have any time for anything else. And I'm barely doing what I know I need to do in order to be good at Kung Fu. And I was doing two to three hours a day of that. And that was when I made the decision that no, this isn't for me anymore. I, I want to put my time into something that's going to produce more results in other areas of my life than what just martial arts will do. Yeah. And just one more thing on that kind of cognitive load idea is that when you are thinking about, um, I guess, reacting to things so much of that, like there's those kind of classic, like reflex reaction tests of like dropping a ruler and trying to catch it as quickly as possible after you see someone open their fingers and like like sure you can train that and you can like go hell for leather at that kind of reactive training but so much of when you're in that um sports context martial arts or, or otherwise so much of it is more about pattern recognition than mm -hmm. necessarily you see something and you react like you see a specific uh, thing and I'm then you so react glad so you're saying this because this is what i wanted to end the conversation on yeah, cool. So yeah, basically that idea of like pattern recognition is that you, as you start to do more and more and you progressively build up with so many automated processes, you can start to recognize certain things happening in your environment that will then you'll be able to predict what's happening. So often when you think you see someone with really fast reflexes, it's not that they can catch a ruler really, really quickly, yeah. it's that they have been in that context before and they have the ability to then like make a pre-planned movement judging yeah. what's happening. Can so I say so no, one no, last... Because no, you've already said something. <laughs> no, but you're going to finish, turn. aren't you? No. You're going to finish... No, okay. no yeah. So the reason why Floyd... Rad mentioned Floyd Mayweather early. I'm a big um, uh, fan of Floyd Mayweather, um, ca beast, Canelo, um, a lot of the uh, um, modern uh, fighters and boxers especially. But any good fighter that you see that looks like they have great reflexes, it's not because they have great reflexes. It's because they've, they've done thousands of hours of training and getting good at their craft that they they end up being able to do exactly what Phil's just explained, which is that they have pattern recognition and they are one step ahead of their opponent. Mm. And so they can predict where that person's going to go before they go so that they're not necessarily reacting to that person's movement. They're, they're one step ahead. Yeah. And that's when you see these guys who just look like they're in a different league, it's because they literally are in a different league. You know, yeah, their skill like, level is What's the uh, Olympic, Olympic table tennis and you're seeing like yeah. just the extreme. It, it, but exactly. like, you'll, you'll notice how they do like that, that funny stomping thing. It's because like the pattern recognition and that that people get with like playing ping pong is you can even hear just how they hit the ball, like which spin that will be and that will inform where they're going. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, that it's like that level of, you know, things that you wouldn't consciously be able to pick up if you just thought about it really hard. It's like, you have to have done that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What were you going to say, sorry, Brad? Um, I have almost forgotten, I think. Oh, okay. So it well, wouldn't um, have been important. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, the takeaway there is like gradually add elements, like don't try and do it all at once and don't fall into that trap of like just, yeah, trying to catch the ruler right. like yeah. <laughs> build uh, up your exposure to different context yeah i remember what i was going to say it's, it um so you know we've given some good insights on what uh what i remember as um you know good reflex um training drills phil's given you some insights into how that all works and then honestly my honest opinion is that you you have to be 
because this is what I found with martial arts. I didn't have anybody that really could explain to me the relevance of not just martial arts training, but other training as well. I only had somebody that was explaining to me the relevance of martial arts. And my teacher was very realistic about how much time was required to get there. That was one of the things that um, I think really turns people off martial arts is that a lot of good teachers will tell you straight up, listen, this is going to take you years to get good at and you're going to have to train for hours a day. And for a lot of people that turns them off. But the problem is that the older we get, the more relevant resistance training becomes to what we do. And if you're doing martial arts, hopefully you're getting enough fitness. I'd I really question your teacher if you're not getting enough fitness and you're doing martial arts training. Um, hopefully you're even getting some good flexibility training. But in my experience, most martial arts um, doesn't really tick the box of good resistance training. And as we get older, you need to start asking yourself, how much time have you got to train? How much time have you got to really dedicate to this thing to, to move that needle that little bit further? And this is really where my decision came because it became very, very clear to me that you know, my first decade of martial arts training, I, I could see some really tangible improvement with where I got to. But then when I was here and I was training and when I'm pointing to Unity Gym and I was training for three hours a day, six days a week, and I was like, how much have I improved in this last year? How much better have I gotten? Or have I really just gotten back to even close to a level when I was at my peak before I joined the army? And that's when I um, started to think of this idea of if I do something that I've never done before, which at the time was to start learning calisthenics and gymnastic strength and put a lot of um, research into newer ways of developing flexibility like end range strength, where's that going to lead me? And with half the time invested in training, I was able to achieve phenomenal changes in my body. And, you yeah. know, I, I just make sure that if any martial artists are listening to this, starting to think, okay, I'm going to start investing all this time into it. You know, start thinking of what stage of life you are, where it's going to lead you, how valuable that is, and, you know, all of those and, things. And just to finish up on that cognitive demand point, there is nothing that is more cognitively demanding than your brain, like, freaking out when you're tired or you're in pain and you're not fit enough for doing an activity. Like, that's going to, like... It, I've really noticed this since getting stuck into all this half Ironman training where I'm doing these sprint sessions and like my my internal voice is just like going on overdrive and it's impossible to like of like this hurts stop <laughs> you're not fit enough you're not strong enough like all those sort of things like if you're having that being your main thought process like you don't have much space for <laughs> for all of these other things that are going into being um, you know fast and, and skillful so if you can build up a really good base level of uh, like sufficient strength and fitness to be like at the level you want for your martial arts and, and mobility then the cognitive demand of those factors will be limited and um, you'll be able to yeah progress really well and my, and my last thought on this is if you really want to improve your reflex in martial arts make sure you do a good warm-up and do it when you're fresh. I wouldn't be doing reflex training with the hope of developing much reflex when you're really cooked at the end of your session. And my final thought is, if you want to improve your reflexes, you have to move around with someone else. Yep. You, you, you're not going to do it by catching coins or yep. hitting paper or Absolutely. whatever else. Yeah, do it with someone who's at the same level so you can gradually build up together or yeah we'll we'll tailor it to your level not just smash yeah it. that's right <laughs> yeah. all right guys that's all we got time for today uh of course as usual if you want to connect with phil outside of the podcast phil can be found on instagram at adpt physio you can also book an in person or an online session with phil at adpt dot physio p h y s i o and we will catch you in the next episode of the sound of movement podcast Boom. See you then.